What does a duchess do when she is no longer Queen of France? Eleanor of Aquitaine was now divorced from Louis VII of France, facing kidnapping as nobles tried to snatch her for marriage and take her lands into the bargain. In this video, we look at how Eleanor left behind her life in France and began a new one as Queen of England. Eleanor's marriage to Louis VII had now been annulled and she was no longer Queen of France. Instead, she swiftly remarried to her cousin, Duke Henry of Normandy. It is even possible that the pair had planned the marriage secretly before her previous marriage to Louis was annulled. The speed with which the couple were married was further testament to this. Just eight weeks after her divorce had been announced, she was wedded to her new 19-year-old husband on the 18th of May, 1152. Where Louis had been reserved and socially awkward in his piety, her new spouse was driven with a restless energy and known for his charisma. However, their marriage was reputed to be tumultuous and filled with passionate tempers on both sides. Nevertheless, the pair understood they were stronger if they worked together, and for Eleanor, that meant creating heirs. Over the next 13 years, she would give birth no less than eight more times, no mean feat in the medieval period when childbirth killed a huge number of women. In 1154, Duke Henry became King Henry II of England as King Stephen died. Just a few weeks after his marriage, Henry had swiftly launched a counter-attack as Louis reacted with fury to the news of his ex-wife remarrying, violently forcing the French army back from the borders of Normandy. And now the Duchy of Normandy was just one part of his territories. And with the addition of Eleanor's Duchy of Aquitaine, between the two of them they had created the Angevin Empire, although it wasn't called that until modern times. It stretched from Carcassonne in the south of France to Northumbria in the north of England. Eleanor was not a woman to be underestimated. She had got herself from a 15-year marriage where she had no effect on policy except in her own state of Aquitaine and she had not done her duty as consort in producing a son, to a new place where she was queen of a new country with a very different man as a husband and already they had a son as an heir. All of this had happened with breathtaking speed, using her considerable skill and forethought. But for the first 15 years of her second marriage, her time was mostly taken up with the main duties of a royal wife, continuing to produce more heirs. Five more boys and three more girls, not counting the two girls she had left behind in Paris. While it's likely there was a small army of wet nurses, maids and tutors, Eleanor nevertheless would have been pregnant for much of those years, and the physical effort of keeping up with a restless husband who moved around his territories without stopping must have been exhausting. And when he was away in his lands while she was in England, she could embody his authority, although that was mostly held firmly in hand by her mother-in-law, Empress Matilda. There is little evidence of what the two women thought of one another, but it seems likely there was at least respect between them. Certainly, if Matilda had openly disliked her daughter-in-law, it would probably have been recorded somewhere. Both were strong, intelligent women who largely had little control over the early parts of their lives. Eleanor and Henry's eldest daughter was even named Matilda after her grandmother. But whatever their feelings, in 1167, Matilda died. Now Eleanor was the main female presence in Henry's life, and she was ready to impose her will on the political stage of England, even if it came at the cost of being the dutiful wife. Much had happened by 1167. The territories Eleanor and Henry ruled over were still held together, and Henry had even put down a rebellion in Anjou by his brother Geoffrey. For the first time, the common law system in England had been overhauled 
to help issues of civil disobedience be carried out in law courts instead of in the king's presence. And Henry's close friend Thomas Becket was now his sworn enemy after it became apparent that he took his duties to the church far more seriously than his duties to the king after being promoted to the See of Canterbury. There were even hints of a tenable peace with France through the agreed marriage of Louis's daughter Marguerite through his second marriage to the young Henry, eldest heir to England since his older brother William had died before the age of three. Henry II now turned his mind to how to divide up his vast territories between his sons. The younger Henry would take on his father's personal lands of England, Normandy and Anjou and would one day be king. Richard, the next in line, would take his mother's duchy of Aquitaine and was engaged to Marguerite's younger sister, Alex. Geoffrey, their third son, would one day inherit Brittany through the betrothal to Constance, only daughter of Duke Conan of Brittany. However, some things were missed, most notably that their youngest son, John, had no lands given at all. This led to him becoming known as John Lackland. But it's not known how much of a hand Eleanor herself had in these events. But in 1168, something shifted between the couple, and events had led up to it. In 1166, the king had publicly acknowledged his mistress, Rosamond Clifford. It must have been somewhat humiliating for Eleanor. Their marriage became strained, and Eleanor took the opportunity to spend time in her own duchy to see to affairs there. No surviving charters for Aquitaine from the period when she had been busy rearing children even mention Eleanor, and perhaps she thought it was time she reminded her people who their duchess was. And Henry did not stop her going. In fact, he escorted her there before continuing on to attack the castle of the rebellious Lusignan family. Eleanor now held control over her own lands once more, but it was amplified by her dual roles as wife and mother. On the one hand, she was governing on behalf of her husband, even if the subjects of Aquitaine had sworn fealty to her first, and on the other, she was maintaining the duchy for her second son, Richard. He spent time with his mother in her native Poitiers, along with his younger brother Geoffrey, both soaking up the culture and language that Eleanor knew so well from childhood. Just as young Henry back in England had already been crowned in a ceremony to formally establish him as the next king, so Richard was invested as the next Duke of Aquitaine in 1172. While not much is known about Eleanor's rule between 1168 and 1171, it is known that she issued around 15 charters in this time, seemingly on her own volition. They were always addressed either from her son and herself, or on behalf of her husband with her name, clear that she was paying lip service, but was in charge in her own right. And Henry, for his part, issued no charters of his own for Aquitaine for this time, or interfered with his wife's. Aquitaine flourished, and stories even appeared of the so-called Court of Love, an unlikely but romantic idea of Eleanor and her daughter Marie judging over lovers' quarrels within the towered palace of Poitiers. This was unlikely to have been a real thing, but the idea was probably born from the cultural riches of music and poetry that were part of the duchy. Things soon began to unravel. Henry and Matilda's eldest son Henry was now 17, and his younger brother Richard was 15. Although King Henry's own father Geoffrey had passed on the Dukedom of Normandy as soon as his son came of age, Henry himself was too controlling to do the same for his sons. And both of them must have had knowledge of their rights, and as we can imagine royal teenage sons might have been, they wanted to prove themselves and have some of the power they were told would be theirs one day. Add to this that their father was likely not present as he sped around his widely spread territory and therefore was not there to calm the situation. 
As a result, an explosive incident occurred in February of 1173. King Henry, travelling with his eldest son, had met in Limoges to agree to a marriage alliance between his six-year-old son John and the daughter of Count Humbert of Maurienne to secure his southeastern border. All went well until he was asked by the Count what lands his young son would bring to the marriage. The response was Chinon, Ludon and Mirabeau, three castles in Anjou. The younger Henry could not restrain himself and exploded with fury. To his mind, Anjou was part of his inheritance, which he still wasn't allowed any control over. And to make matters worse, part of this was now being given away to his baby brother without his consent. He publicly declared his father would not do this. King Henry was unsurprisingly not moved. Aside from any need he may have had to secure his borders, the young Henry was not ready for the responsibility. Apart from his public and childish outburst, he had gathered a large retinue around him that he couldn't afford to pay or reward, and as a result, he was sunken in debt. And this might have ended at nothing more than an embarrassing adolescent tantrum, had it not been for the younger Henry's father-in-law, Louis VII. Although publicly there was peace between France and England, Louis VII would have been happy to cause any irritation or worst for his rival, and it's likely he was encouraging and supporting from behind the scenes. The danger of this increased when rumours abounded of Henry's younger brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, being supportive of his cause. But what was Eleanor's part in all this? the young Henry fled to Paris from beneath his father's supervision into the welcoming security of Louis VII. But even more shockingly came the news that his younger brothers Richard and Geoffrey, now 15 and 14 respectively, had joined him there. They were too young to make political decisions entirely on their own, and so the only conclusion that could be drawn was that of their mother's influence. It was clear that as they had been left under her wing in Aquitaine, she had sided with her eldest son's side of things and was now in open revolt against her husband. And what explanation is given as to why she suddenly decided on this course of action? Historians throughout the ages, predictably when a woman comes into play in a political drama, have often put it down to matters of the heart. It was well known about Fair Rosamond the very public mistress King Henry kept. And now, it was whispered, Eleanor's desire to have the king's love had finally made her plot against him. Stories reveled in proclaiming how she encouraged her sons to rebel in order to help her poison her rival. The fact there is no evidence of any of this did not stem the rumours. And it is true that Eleanor's personal life had revealed she was apt to make decisions on a somewhat more emotional level, such as leaving her first husband. But after more than two years of ruling Aquitaine by herself with no interference from King Henry, it's more likely the reason for her rebellion was for her own independence. And there are signs of this. Three of her later charters did not mention her husband at all instead addressed simply to her own faithful followers, and she personally had visits from the kings of Navarre and Aragon Barcelona. But for all this, the revenue from her lands still went into her husband's coffers, and she had no military might to impose rule or order on her own. Her feelings, therefore, were probably similar to her eldest son's, Both had been promised power and control of lands by King Henry, and both found themselves either without it or lacking the full political might to rule entirely autonomously. And a lesser person might have decided going against a king, especially one so iron-willed and resolute as Henry, would be a dangerous idea. But Eleanor had proven many times that she wasn't one to be held back by fear of consequences, such as with the rumours surrounding her uncle and herself, and manoeuvring herself from being Queen of France to Queen of England almost effortlessly. 
Just as before in her life, the chroniclers of the time leapt on the unfolding events with horrified glee, calling her three sons the devil's brood, an insinuation, of course, of the condition of Eleanor herself in their eyes. While the actions of the young Henry could be understood in medieval culture, as there were not only historical but also biblical references to draw on, Eleanor was a different matter. Never before had a queen stood against her husband, committing the double assault as a citizen of the king and his wife. Queens were meant to be the peacemakers and aides. Everything Eleanor was doing stood against the very fabric of medieval patriarchal society. The Archbishop of Rouen reminded her in a public letter, "Man is the head of woman." This probably goes some way to explaining how Eleanor was presented at the time and later on. Ignoring these threats in her customary fashion, Eleanor instead set about gathering support from the Aquitaine lords and barons who had always resented being ruled from England, and Louis VII, for his part, set about assembling a large group of intimidating allies to stand with the younger Henry. This, of course, came with promises of lands and territory should they succeed. In order to snatch his inheritance, it seemed, the young Henry had to break it apart piecemeal fashion. And with this ensemble of nobles prepared to meet Henry head-on, Eleanor made her next move. But it was a miscalculation. She made her way to return to the court at Paris, but somewhere north of Poitiers, while on the road, she was captured by King Henry and his forces, rumored to be disguised in men's clothes. She was immediately taken prisoner, but her arrest was not announced publicly. For now, however, King Henry's immediate concern was to stamp out the revolt of his sons. Despite the numbers they and Louis the Seventh pulled together, it was clear they were no match for King Henry's military genius and professional mercenaries. And in autumn of 1173, he offered them terms of peace. It was clear he wanted his heirs on his side once more, but they refused and continued on bullheaded. The conflict continued until 1174, but by that point, it was clear they had lost, and they bowed their heads to their father. He was generous in his victory, however, soothing the humiliating loss to their father with money and noble but unfortified castles in the territories they laid claim to. Peace was made, and Henry was magnanimous as he was united once more with his sons. Leaving them an honourable defeat, blame was placed on the older, more experienced barons who had encouraged them. But there would be no such peace with Eleanor. Perhaps the sons could be forgiven because they were teenagers, acting before thinking with adolescent certainty and lack of political expertise. But their mother was different. With a cool head, it was almost certain Eleanor had planned the whole thing behind the scenes. And had done so for the benefit of making Aquitaine independent. She had already spent the entire conflict in prison, and it would now be very rare that she got to spend time with her beloved children. Eleanor was kept in such confinement; it is not even known where exactly she was held, except that it was in England. No doubt Henry hoped to seal off as much contact with the outside world as possible, and no doubt Eleanor. Attempted to subvert this as much as possible. We don't even know if she had heard the news that her son Richard now ruled Aquitaine in her place, demolishing castles and forces of those who had once been his allies in the name of cementing his father's rule. But while Richard became a ruthlessly efficient military leader, single-minded and without mercy, his older brother, young Henry, could not say the same. Young Henry. Now actually twenty, preferred pretend warfare to the real thing, dragging his large entourage around France and putting on tournaments for them to compete in. Most of them were landless knights, younger sons unlikely to receive anything from their fathers, and feeding eagerly off the spoils Henry lavished them with. Despite the lesson he had been taught, it appeared the heir to the English throne had not taken it to heart. 
Henry continued to believe with a blind optimism that his son would, in time, mature and become the heir he needed. Sadly, no sign of this was forthcoming, and in 1183, again King Henry had to face rebellion from his eldest son. This time, the young Henry decided to pick a fight in his younger brother's territory of Aquitaine, perhaps jealous at the control he was afforded, and rallied the barons who were angry at Richard's raising of their estates. Eleanor was not needed to cause the conflict. King Henry immediately sent troops to bolster Richard's forces, and they defeated the younger Henry at a siege of Limoges. Fleeing into Aquitaine, Henry caught dysentery and didn't recover. When it was clear he was facing his final days, he begged for his father's forgiveness, sending an urgent message to him. But trust was now broken, and King Henry, believing this to be a trick of some sort, refused to go, sending one of his rings in his place. Before he died, young Henry also pleaded with his father to show his mother leniency, before passing away at just 28 years old, his revolt collapsing with him. When Eleanor heard the news back in England, it must have been a terrible event. Years later, in 1193, she would tell Pope Celestine III that she was tortured by the memory of her eldest son. However, perhaps the death of the young and impetuous prince had moved something within his grief-stricken father, for 18 months later in Christmas of 1184, Eleanor was permitted out of her captivity temporarily to spend it with her children. But this went no further. Eleanor remained a prisoner, however comfortable her surroundings may have been, and Henry would only reveal her at times when it was to his advantage. Sometime in 1183, she was brought to Normandy to help Henry's claim to the lands there. Louis VII had died three years earlier, and his son and successor, King Philippe II of France, was trying to claim properties in Normandy on behalf of his half-sister Marguerite, widow of the young Henry. King Henry stated that they had in fact belonged to Eleanor, and that the properties were hers once again on their son's death. But it wasn't long before the sniping began again, and this time it was John who began small raids on Richard's lands in Aquitaine. This was partly with his father's annoyance at Richard, who had been ordered to hand his lands over to his mother once more, in order that he would instead take on the mantle of his dead brother's territories, but had refused. John had support from Geoffrey as well, now the ruler of Brittany through his wife, and hoping for more parts of his family's vast empire. The visit at Christmas 1184 of Eleanor to see her sons was therefore less shocking than it might have seemed. No doubt she could be a calming influence between them, and both parents ensured the conflict stopped before it started. And so in April 1185, when Richard was once more told to relinquish Aquitaine to his mother's hands, he did so with full compliance. She could not threaten his place as Duke, and King Henry could still claim control over it through his wife. Only Eleanor could have helped this tense situation with her strong hold over her ancestral lands and a motherly concern for her remaining sons. But of course, she was nothing more than a placeholder. She was still a prisoner. But this finally came to an end on the 6th of July, 1189, when Henry II died. Their son Richard was his undisputed heir, becoming Richard I of England. One of his first acts as king was to immediately send William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, to free his mother from prison. However, William found upon his arrival that her custodians had already carried out the king's wishes. Richard also sent word that his mother would rule in his stead while he quelled revolt in Normandy that had been aimed at his father, stating, according to the historian Ralph of Disseto, that Eleanor should have the power of doing whatever she wished in the kingdom. This, unlike her previous stints as queen, was not a mere shadow of power as a consort, but Richard giving his mother the same power to rule as he would. Eleanor responded to this, 
by travelling around the country and sending out trusted men to see that abuses of local officials were corrected, that all free men gave an oath of loyalty to Richard and, most tellingly, to empty the prisons. Ironically, this went unquestioned. It would seem that being a Queen Mother meant the fact she was a woman simply no longer mattered. To add to this, she had been a notable peaceful presence for her sons in the last 15 years and was seen as separate from the instability that had occurred in that time. And when Richard sailed into Portsmouth, he was greeted warmly and happily by the crowds that waited there. Of course, family conflict was never far away. And before leaving for the Crusades, Richard made his brother John swear to stay away from England for three years. John was Lord of Ireland, and his brother had given him Mortain in France, properties in England, and his recent marriage to Isabella of Gloucester added still more. But it wasn't enough. John was given two reasons to increase the tension. One was Richard agreeing to make his nephew, Arthur of Brittany, heir presumptive. And the second reason was the unpopularity of the chief minister Richard had chosen, Willem de Longchamp. He was alienating the English lords who already resented being imposed on by a low-ranking Norman. By summer 1191, Longchamp and John were staring each other down with their armies, attacking each other's estates. This was only calmed when Richard sent the Archbishop Walter of Rouen to make a fragile peace between the two sides, taking over the discredited Justicar Longchamp's duties. Eleanor travelled with him as far as her manor between Caen and Rouen, a place to watch her son's lands on both sides of the Channel, but it wasn't long before she was forced to travel to England. In February 1192, she set off for Portsmouth to prevent her son John from attempting to take his brother's throne while he lived. John had conspired with King Philippe of France, who was still angry with Richard for throwing off the betrothal he had held with Philippe's sister, Alex, who had been put aside on the spurious rumours of being a lover of his father's. Philippe, seeing his opportunity to cause chaos in his enemy's kingdom, promised Alex's hand to John, along with the Angevin lands he was overlord of. John did not hesitate, prepared to immediately put aside his marriage to Isabella and sent word for a ship at Southampton to sail to France. Only one person would have been able to calm this situation, and it was Eleanor, with her unique combination of being the mother to both Richard and John, politically astute and worldly wise, and unafraid of confrontation. She immediately arranged four meetings with the barons of England to put pressure on John. Royal chroniclers would later put her part in this as that of a worried mother shedding tears over her youngest child. This hid the reality. She made a clear and steely threat that if John defected to France, he would lose his English lands and titles. It was enough to stem the conflict for now. Between 1190 and 1194, Richard was away from the lands he was king for, occupied instead with the Third Crusade. In this time, England was maintained by the Council of Regency, a group of trusted noblemen, but Eleanor still held considerable autonomy and influence. But late in 1192, he was captured going through Europe before he could get to the safety of his brother-in-law Heinrich's lands in Saxony. During the Crusades, he had made an enemy of Leopold of Austria, and he had already fallen out with Philippe of France. While he was held in captivity by Henry VI, Holy Roman Emperor, it was Eleanor who held a key role in securing his ransom and release. She wrote several letters to Pope Celestine III in 1193, expressing how she was wasted away by sorrow at her son's imprisonment. No doubt feelings of her own captivity were mixed with those of a mother's loss, thinking on the children she had already lost. John, meanwhile, went once more for France after receiving a letter from Philippe on his brother's unfortunate capture, preparing to marry Alex and raise a revolt in England. But he was not the formidable force of his mother, 
and the military forces she raised were more than enough to quickly put down his attempted rebellion. For his treachery, he lost three more castles that now were put in the care of his mother. Eleanor then travelled to Cologne with Richard's ransom to join the English delegation there, and it was her careful suggestion that Richard should allow the Kingdom of England to be surrendered to the Holy Roman Emperor, receiving it back from him once free as an imperial fief. This, in reality, made no difference to the powers or political implications of Richard being king, and it secured his release on the 4th of February, 1194. When he returned to England and went to Westminster for a ceremonial crown-wearing, it was Eleanor, the king's mother, who sat opposite him in great pomp and status. She had become not only the embodiment of his power when away as the king's mother, but mother to the whole kingdom. And she continued as a mother to create peace between her warring sons. When she travelled with Richard to Normandy to push back Philippe of France's advance, his brother John fell at his feet and begged for forgiveness, which was readily given. No doubt this was the work of Eleanor again, who would recognise that John's panic at his brother being returned to England in one piece and Richard's determination to push back against Philippe could work together. It worked, and Eleanor retired to Fontevrain Abbey, the administration of England now ably run by trusted men and Richard's missives across the Channel. She also didn't contest the Duchy of Aquitaine, content, it seems, for her son Richard to continue to hold the lands and keep them as she would have done. Like her mother-in-law Matilda, it would seem her mind turned from political matters in her old age to the matter of her soul. But the peace was not to last. In March 1199, Richard, on yet another campaign in Aquitaine, was hit by a loosed bolt. He tried to remove the arrow himself, a surgeon doing the rest when it broke off in his hands, but the wound soon became infected. On the 6th of April, with his mother by his side, he died, his heart taken to Rouen and his body interred at Fontevrain. But he hadn't done much to secure the succession after he passed. In the eight-year marriage with his queen, Berengaria, she had seen him for only four months, barely any time to produce any hope of a legitimate heir. Enemies of Richard wasted no time in suggesting their choice for the throne of England. His nephew, Arthur of Brittany, son of his deceased brother, Geoffrey, Eleanor, however, knew that it didn't matter who came in an ancestral line, but who had command of the largest political force. John set out immediately for France, taking control of Anjou's treasury and meeting with his mother before continuing on to Rouen, where he was crowned as Duke of Normandy. He returned, after stopping to sack those cities who had sided with his rival, to Westminster Abbey, to be invested as the next King of England. This was sensible, as he was known in Normandy and England, and this could be a secure base. Arthur was known for his Breton heritage and held fast to his lands there. But Aquitaine was an unknown quantity to John. Richard had grown up there and was well known to its people, if both liked and disliked in equal measure. John, by contrast, had barely been there in 15 years. He ran the risk of losing it. But his mother Eleanor, the Duchess of 70 years who had held it close to her heart, could help him in this. Instead of a peaceful retirement, she found herself riding out to raid Anjou with an army behind her in order to become the ruler once more of her domains in the name of her youngest son. They marched through establishing rule in the name of John, but Eleanor left them and went south to her own territory. Travelling south through Aquitaine, she made promises and rewards ensuring loyalty of her subjects to her own person, before travelling once more north to Tours to do something unprecedented. In this period, women did not pay homage to kings, even if they were legal heirs to their lands. A husband or son did it in their place. 
but Eleanor bent the knee, and Philippe accepted her claim. This, importantly, prevented Philippe from making any further claim to her lands as he accepted her own, meaning also that it could not be considered for any other, including Arthur of Brittany. In asserting her duchy's independence, Eleanor preserved it for her son John through her person, later formally recognising the fact in a document. Peace was made again in January 1200, when John and Philippe agreed to a union between the French king's son Louis and one of John's nieces by his sister, also named Eleanor, and Philippe agreed in turn to recognise John as his brother's heir in return for homage. Again, the elder Eleanor had to step into political life to choose which of her granddaughters would become the future French queen. Now 77, she left from Poitiers, only to be ambushed and held captive by Hugh IX of Lusignan, whose lands had been sold to Henry II by his ancestors. Eleanor secured her freedom by agreeing to grant him the county of La Marche before continuing on her journey. When at the Castilian court of her daughter Eleanor, whom she hadn't seen for nearly 30 years, it must have been an anathema to her recent tragedies to finally meet her two granddaughters, Uraca and Blanca. Eleanor chose the younger, the 11-year-old Blanca, to be the future Queen of France, and they set out for Paris. But finally the stress of journeying took its toll on the seemingly unstoppable Eleanor, and she fell ill. She passed the care of her granddaughter onto the Archbishop of Bordeaux for the final leg of their journey to Normandy. And when the splendid ceremony for the princess and future King of France occurred, Eleanor was not there to see it. She had retired once more to Fontevrand Abbey, where she attempted to recover from her illness. When war broke out between John and Philippe once more, Eleanor declared her support for John and set out from Fontevrand to her capital, Poitiers, to prevent her grandson, Arthur, from attempting once more to take England's possessions. Arthur learned of her whereabouts and besieged her in the castle of Mirabeau. Although John had never been known for his military brilliance, when he received a note from his mother, covertly smuggled from the walls of her new prison, he turned his army south and marched for Mirabeau. He captured both his nephew Arthur and Hugh de Lusignan, both of them disappearing into one of his fortresses. Rumours abounded that Arthur was actually dead, so little was known of their fate. But Eleanor once more was free, and this time she must have been determined to have some peace at the end of her long life. Returning once again to the now familiar Fontevrand Abbey, she took the veil as a nun. While support for her son John crumbled without the active and astute help of his mother, Eleanor retreated into silence. It is unknown what she made of the loss of her husband's empire through his son's hands, or even if she was aware at all. But on the 31st of March 1204, now 82 years of age, Eleanor of Aquitaine finally passed away. She was buried by the side of her husband Henry II, Richard, and her daughter Joanna. Her effigy showed a tall, elegant woman in repose, with a Bible open in her hands, a peaceful expression on her face. With no description of her looks, such as eye or hair colour, this is the closest image to what Eleanor may have looked like. And after her death, John's nickname of Lackland became an insult rather than an expression of sympathy, as he proved unable to hold together what was left of lands in France as his mother and father had done. Normandy and Anjou gave their allegiance to the French crown with no resistance, but there was one area left that remained in England's grasp. The memory of the great Duchess Eleanor was so pervasive so deeply embedded in the very soil and hearts of those who resided in her lands, that when everything settled, Aquitaine was the only part of France that remained to the English crown. 
in memory of their Poitavan ruler who had been mother to England and an empire. <laughs>